and welcome to yet another and second to the last lecture in the series of the architecture class. Uh, I'm delighted to uh, make a short introduction for um, of Liam Young, our guest tonight. And uh, first of all, Liam, thank you so much also for being with us and for uh, sitting through and contributing to the review of the first day group's work today. Um, that was very exciting. Um, obviously, Liam presumably doesn't need very much of an introduction. I think the, um, his, his work is um, known. That should um, a number of people here tells me that. Um, Liam started out uh, basically with a very normal architectural um, background. He studied, uh, he did his bachelor and his master at the Queensland University in, uh, in Australia. That was in 2002 he finished the master. Um, you won a prize for it, also for technology and a dean's prize, I believe. He, um, and he has worked in offices, um, amongst them lab architects in um, Australia with presumably Don Bates and uh, at Saha did architects. And then at one point he um, did not leave architecture, but basically instead of designing buildings, started to look at cities and make, amongst other things, films. He has written books since then. Um, he has been the co-curator of the Lisbon Biennale in, in Port uh, Architectural Biennale in Portugal. Um, his work has been collected by um, both the Victorian Albert and the Museum of Modern Art. He appears uh, everywhere in the world for lectures, talks at uh, various uh, festivals. And the work, of course, has much to do with um, technology, but it also has to do with the vision of the city, a um, speculation um, on future urbanisms. And it was also, um, uh, I suppose, uh, anchored in two important moments in 2008, both of them, where he founded uh, the think tank Tomorrow's Thoughts Today, and then also the Unknown Fields Division, which is a, um, called a nomadic design studio. I believe it's sometimes part of the AA visiting um, uh, program, where um, school where. Um, Liam is also the coordinator for this. And just to give you a taste, um, and you might know this, but still, let me read that the, with the unknown fields, um, he has developed research projects through expeditions from the Ecuadorian, Amazon, and the Galapagos Islands to the far north Alaska, the mining landscapes of the Australia outback, the Chernobyl exclusion zone, Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan, the rare earth mines of remote China. They have been aboard the container ships of global supply chains and the endangered ecologies of Madagascar. And through these excursions, of course, um, I do not know precisely what the research reveals, but obviously it fuels a speculation that has caught attention worldwide. Uh, Liam has been um, called amongst the 25 most important people for the future of architecture by Blueprint magazine. He um, has appeared in all numerous magazines and newspapers for his work. He consults, he runs workshops, and he produces, um, like I have already said, mentioned um, wonderful movies. I think one of the last ones was um, done with using drones and cameras traveling through the city and uh, producing um, internet, um, uh, its own internet um, network. So, and part of, this, um, part of this research and part of these speculations also take place in academic institutions. Uh, he is a um, visiting professor at Princeton University. Uh, he teaches at the AA, and not the least also, he then runs um, one of the postgraduate studios at SciArc, um, in where he's a colleague, of course, of both David Ruri and, and um, Peter Trummer. 
Um, we're delighted to have you here, Liam, and thank you so much for taking the time. Please welcome. Thanks, Ben. Um, uh, can you hear me on the mic all right? Is that coming through? Test one, test, test. Um, uh, thanks so much for the, for the invitation. Um, I don't think I've been to Frankfurt, uh, or at least not to this school before, um, and happy to continue the deep-seated relationship between Städelschule and uh, SIARC. Um, so I should say I come in here in that capacity, bearing gifts um, from the new Masters in Fiction and, and Entertainment. Um, and with that in mind, tonight we're going um, to travel through a future city. Um, I'm going to try and tell you a story for the next 45 minutes. Um, uh, because, um, let's play something in the background. No. Play. Yeah, classy. Um, so, uh, as Johan mentioned, I'm... Uh, what I like to describe as a speculative architect, which means I don't design buildings, but instead I work between documentary and fiction to tell stories about the architectural, urban, and global implications of emerging technologies. So within our work, we borrow from the techniques of fiction, film, and performance to collect and visualize stories, both real and imagined, to engage audiences through the extraordinary ways that technology is changing our world. And we look at how all of the tech that we love is actually produced and, and what it's doing to us and how it changes our cities and how it changes how we relate to each other and to our world. And we hope that by understanding these technologies, the architectural implications and possibilities then we may all somehow become more critical consumers and producers of our own futures rather than just standing in line waiting for the next iPhone to be released. So it's this idea of exploring alternative worlds as a means to understand our own world in new ways, or the idea of designing and exploring architecture as a process of world building that we try and do um, through the work to try and engage in these critical issues that are changing cities. So the project behind me right now is one we just launched last month at Documenta in Athens, where we used fiction as a space in which to prototype the lives of a future Athens apartment block, not as a form of prediction about what might happen or, or what the city might look like in 30 years time, but rather as a mechanism through which to reframe some of the issues of the present, or at least to make visible some of the tensions that uh, simmer below the surface. So with that in mind, what I'm gonna do tonight is not talk about a series of buildings, but rather I'm gonna tell you a story about a city of digital technologies, a city of the future, but also a city that in many ways is actually already here. Because we're really interested in the work in this idea that fiction is this extraordinary shared language and it's a vehicle through which our culture shares and disseminates ideas. And I also believe it's one of the ways that architects can play a much more active role in thinking about what new technologies may mean for the spaces, buildings and cities we all live in. And in a way, it's a, it's a way of circumventing the extremely slow process of making buildings and presenting ideas to a more general audience um, in a form that they might actually understand and care about. So tonight, we're all gonna take a seat in the back of a driverless taxi, and we're gonna go on a tour through a near future smart city. So we're interested in this term smart city that us architects use it's a term that we use to describe all the ways that technologies are changing our world. It's the, it's the world of driverless cars, of smartphones, of augmented reality glasses, 
of Pokemon Go, of Wi-Fi hotspots, Amazon delivery drones and internet connected fridges. Um, these are all technologies that are changing what cities are and we're going to see the city, this future city, through the eyes of the smart cities network of autonomous sensors and machines. I'm going to try and do it as this live kind of video mix, audio mix thing. And hopefully it doesn't go wrong. So this, for example, is how our driverless taxi sees the city as these 3D point clouds generated by laser scanners, which are the next generation of CCTV cameras. One of the key data acquisition and surveillance technologies upon much of which this smart city systems are based. So these are scenes from a science fiction we've made called Where the City Can't See, which is the first narrative film shot entirely using this laser scanning technology. So I'm going to tell you a series of stories that form a portrait of this city. It's a city stitched together from documentary footage of real sites that we've visited with the nomadic research studio I run with Kate Davies called Unknown Fields and short fragments of speculative film projects that I develop out of these conditions with my um, Urban Futures Think Tank Tomorrow's Thought Today or within the Unknown Fields studio. So let's tap our destinations into our smartphones and buckle up as we travel from the edges of the city to see where all our contemporary technologies begin their lives and finish in the city centre to see the augmented creatures that we've all become. these sites to, to see landscapes in which we perhaps no longer belong. We'll trace their glitches, anomalies, and we'll see where the digital bubbles to the surface to condense into the landscapes, architectures and natures of our impending smart city. So up there in the sky is delicately dancing with gravity as a Google Earth satellite. And through the optical technologies of this hurtling bird of heat panels and reflective shields, it looks down on the Earth and it tiles together a digital map of its surface. A data territory that binds the smart city together. A site that our taxi now drifts through. 
So at the resolution of these maps through which we live most of our lives, a pixel is just less than half a meter in scale. It's just a bit bigger than the width of our bodies. So at this scale, we're actually just a kind of discoloration or a dead pixel that's thoroughly embedded in the grain of technology and indistinguishable from the technology that surrounds us. And we keep driving through the point cloud mist and the city points out a structure out the, dip, out the window and in the distance, we can see the tracery of markings that are scored across its surface. And these aren't evidence of some ancient tribal culture or a forgotten relic of the Nazca lines, but these are the traces of the new tribes of the digital. These are the animal tracks of the orbiting satellites above. So this, in the center of the screen, is a calibration target. It's a machine vision graphic that's etched into the ground of the city and supports this whole system through its precision. And these patterns were created to give satellite-mounted cameras something on which to calibrate their lenses. So the skin of the city is a digital test pattern. And like a cave painting, they're the primitive markings of a new urban culture firmly on the rise. And we keep on traveling like explorers across this pixel sea. And we listen to a tall, salty tale of one of its less well-trodden areas. The city tells us about Sandy Island. This is about the Sandy Island mystery that was in the Sydney Morning Herald. Sandy Island was actually um, found on the Google Earth. So just off the coast of the city is Sandy Island. It's a collection of dark pixels, GPS coordinates, hyperlinks and stories. It was originally charted by the whaling ship Velocity in 1876. And the island has long been what's called an evidence-doubtful landmass. It was a place perhaps originally recorded to be a trap to support a mapped copyright. Or perhaps it was a mislabeled pile of volcanically ejected pumice that was seen drifting on the horizon. But whatever it was, this cartographic apparition remained visible in the Google Earth model of the city until an Australian research vessel confirmed its non-existence during a 2012 expedition to survey the ocean floor. So up until that point, to a world of Google explorers and hyperlink adventurers, Sandy Island was just as real as any other place that they visited online. And it's a place, it's an architecture, it's a landscape that raises the question that if the places and spaces that we inhabit exist solely through the mediums in which we experience them, they become, perhaps they become just as real as any other physical place that might exist anywhere else in the world. So it suggests an architecture of GPS points, of point clouds, of information with no physical footprint. That's North on Wellington Road. And in a way, this type of architecture constitutes our new city. So the smart city operates on this strange one-to-one -one digital model of the world. And the pixel is the territory. And the driverless car is our vessel. And the city turns to us and smiles with the grin of Severus, silica. And like early web crawlers, we now traverse the city and its streets and we're collecting data and we're feeding the city because just like Google, the smart city uses driverless cars to ground truth its maps and correlate the data from the satellites glinting above. And our car is scanning the landscape and it shoots out this laser at a million times a second, reflecting off the world and rendering it as a point cloud. And in a way, this is how our technologies see the smart city. This is the view from an autonomous drone that's drifting above us. So in machine vision systems, a fiducial is what we call a recognizable marker that's placed in the environment that's used for calibration and navigation. And as the pixel is now reshaping our cities, we're seeing the emergence of a new genre of architecture, a kind of fiducial architecture that's designed to be read by the eyes of machines rather than our own vision and patterns of occupation. 
So in a way, we're no longer making cities for ourselves anymore, but for the optimization of these systems. So the life of the old city, its nuance, its subtlety, is now seen as these blank geometries of calibration markers and simple surfaces. It looks, through their eyes, like an animated cubist painting, where every meaningful inch can be calculated and measured. And as we keep on driving, we move through a landscape where all these technologies began. We drift through Chile and Bolivia, past the evaporation ponds of the world's largest lithium mines. So this is the landscape behind the scenes of all the batteries that power our cities, where 70% of the world's lithium is buried. So if the future is electric, if the future is Elon Musk and his Tesla fuel dreams, then the future is buried here, beneath the salt flats of Bolivia. And as we keep on driving, we see through the point clouds another cavernous landscape of our ephemeral technologies. And in a way, it's in these massive mining excavations and large-scale evaporative pools scattered on the edge of the world that our new digital reality, our new smart city, begins and ends its life. And we each have a little bit of the gold and aluminium from these sites in the smart technologies in our pockets. They're charged and quietly vibrating. And now the digital models of these landscapes are linked live to the fluctuations of metal prices on the stock market. So as explosive diggers and drills have replaced the slow erosion of rivers and earthquakes, we're now scoring our economy into the archaeological record itself. And the landscape becomes a chronicle of the digital permutations that drive the modern world. And in the same landscape, we see vehicles that are just like ours, that no longer have drivers, but are just systems. And mining trucks rumble up mountains and carve soil along GPS trails. And as we drive deeper into the dust, we see the rhythms of the human conveyor belts in Madagascar, where 70% of the world's precious gemstones comes from. And here it's cheaper to pay 20 men in rice than it is to maintain and fuel a mechanical conveyor belt. So a hidden black market supply chain connects two choreographies, one here in the lawless mine sites and the other in the jewelry stores, hip hop music videos and celebrity red carpets across the ocean in the city centers we all know. So for the jewelry of the smart city, We've used the amount of rice the human conveyor belt consumes in a day to manufacture a single synthetic gemstone, where the rice is subjected to intense heat and pressure in the lab to produce a diamond for a gold hip-hop tooth, and a music video which embodies the intimate and profound connections that these two worlds sit across. And now, our driverless taxi rolls up to the shores of the city's radioactive lake in Inner Mongolia. And this is some of the first footage of the toxic waste that sits beside the world's largest rare earth mineral refinery. Then we take a selfie with our phones and we see our reflection in the mirrored screen because the material to polish its glass and run its software produces this very lake and collapse together in a single luminous surface. We see ourselves and this black black earth. So from this sludge we're making a vase for the smart city to thank it for its tour. It's a set of vases made from the amount of waste created in the production of free objects. An iPhone, a MacBook and a Tesla electric car battery. It's a Ming vase for the Hello City generation. And as we keep on moving in our taxi our journey through the city is taking us across the planet and a city like this one can no longer be described as a single point on the map anymore. And our technologies cast shadows across the earth. And landscapes at the scale of the pixel will affect landscapes at the scale of canyons and continents. And here on this ocean we pack up all the objects and materials produced in these sites. And we send them off in ships around the world. And this 
is the computer-controlled container fleet of the mega shipping industry that now also navigates autonomously based on these GPS satellites. And the ship captain and the portside crane operators, they've also been made obsolete. And they're just passengers in the machine, their bodies repurposed as a component in the landscape scaled robot that stacks the containers ready for transport, bringing our goods all the way home. And in a way, these are the human machines of the production line. It's orchestrated by efficiency algorithms. These are the real robots of our new cities of technology, where the body is matched in speed to the conveyor belt that turns in front of us. So in many ways, this is us in the smart city, where every meaningful moment can somehow be counted and measured. And the efficient city is hungry and it feeds on our data in a way it is our data fed back to us like a dog eating its own vomit. So on the conveyor belt, we're now doing the biology, what we once did to the production of technology. And in the city, we're now beginning to manufacture all our own fish, matched to the color of our eyes or to our shoes. My mother used to tell me that I had the most beautiful eyes. I liked hearing that. I like it when people look into my eyes, when they stare at them. Royal blue with an amber halo. icons and smart city graphics and turf wars are being fought between Android and Apple and gadgets are becoming lifestyle and as we travel from the periphery of the city cent- city into its center we hear a ringtone symphony that echoes through the streets and we're all vibrating chiming and chirping are you a customer or a citizen, the city says. It finds such questions difficult and it glares at us with a million sensor eyes. And we get back in our taxi and now the city takes us to the residential districts to visit the Samsung Towers. And we put our ears to the cool beveled aluminium door of one of the apartments and we listen to a conversation inside. And from through the door we hear someone called Duri drop a Samsung Galaxy SX phone onto the kitchen table and we hear as it chimes softly and makes contact with the paper-thin Samsung Kui smart power charging mat and we hear her scream down the hallway at her husband raising her voice above the Samsung air conditioner why does the new TV say uh, LG on it she says what do you mean it because it's made by LG her husband replies 
What are you trying to do? She says, you, are you trying to get us thrown out? Our lease is up for a few months. A review in three months and you bought an LG TV into a Samsung housing block. What the hell are the neighbors going to say? She screams. And the city just shrugs. It uses Apple and it doesn't care for the tribulations of the Samsungese. It says, let's move on. We get back in the taxi and we head to our next stop where the city takes us to visit the control room. Hidden in an anonymous shed within the depths of the city. So, uh, who's in charge then? I ask the city. Why, you are, of course, says the smart city excitedly. And that's the rhetoric that all these technologies are based around. That our own data feeds and patterns of occupation drive all these systems. But just like the driverless car, the control room is empty and the city has outsourced its management tasks to low-res image recognition algorithms. And a citywide data set is fed by countless sensors, cameras, and satellites and is translated into the service stacks and ultimately into the complexities of urban life. So the city that was once publicly elected now disappears into the fog of the cloud and is managed by tech companies and proprietary software systems. Have you met Lena? the city says. Here she is, she's from 1972 Swedish Playboy and she works here in the control room of the city. Selina is the face that was used to define the early training set for every facial recognition algorithm that the world now uses. She's a true ghost in the machine and she's just one example of how the smart city's technologies of scanning and understand the wo- understanding the world is not neutral at all because encoded into these rules are racial bias, Western privilege, ideology, and an agenda of simplicity and efficiency, but not for all. And in rooms like this one is where the city lives, and perhaps where all of us live. It's an ignored part of the city, but it's such an intimate landscape for all of us. So tripping the light fantastic and following the fiber, the city invites us in and we arrive at the data center. This is the landscape of everything. All of our shitty inane YouTube videos, all our chatter, our hopes, dreams, desires, and darkest fears are here. And the electric car motor has given way to the whir of cooling fans. And these systems are not a grand cathedral, It's not a great library, but at a time when our collective history is digital, this is our generation's cultural legacy. And perhaps in this context, we'll soon write soliloquies for the server aisles, the way we once did for rolling hills. And couples may steam up the windows of a car parked in the artificial moonlight of vast data complexes and power plant fog hangs heavy in the air and it looms like storm clouds. And we picnic under the sodium glow of a row of artificial suns. And what will we do with these landscapes? Will we travel to them and inhabit them like a forest? Will will we visit the data center like we once did to a church on Sundays? Will we travel there to meet our digital selves and gaze across the server racks and watch us winking black in a million LEDs of Facebook blue. As we gaze across the future of this landscape, we see a couple of kids in the server racks in the distance. They're digging for scraps of information, anything they can salvage and hope to sell on. Two of them are fighting over a morsel of text. I see the face of a one-time film star, a spectral mask that's floating in the air like insect silk. And looking back, we can see the city's skyline, and we see ghosts of data rising from the outer regions. So many flickers of light, dots of color, notes of music, Images, words, and fragments, all drifting towards the vast, shining towers of the central zone and the financial district and the industrial landscapes 
from which we've become. We jump back in the taxi and we keep on driving. And in a way, like Lena, other strange creatures roam these territories of the city and they bleep and they glitch. Hey guys, says a soda machine. So in the 80s, a soft drink vending machine was the first device to be connected to the computer network. It sent data of its contents to everyone in the office down the hall. And my water bottle hasn't spoken to me in weeks. So it's refreshing to hear the virtues of staying hydrated again. So this vending machine, this smart object is the triumph of all of our ingenuity. It's the result of this planetary scaled network we've been traveling across. A result of the largest construction project in human history. And it tells us the time. It tells us if our drink is cold or not. It saves us from getting off our chair. So, uh, you, you want a Pepsi? The soda machine asks. Throughout, throughout history, the city has stood quiet. And now we're making this world of living objects that listen, watch, and talk back. And everything is connected to everything. And the rhetoric of the Internet of Things will make our lives better, fulfilled, and happy. And appliances hum, and the cooling fans whir, and babies drift off to sleep amid white noise lullabies. Our network coverage flickers, our South animated Korea world's woman glitch got a rude awakening and buffer. when she left her robot vacuum to do the cleaning while she took a nap. The vacuum cleaner reportedly mistook the woman for dust, locked onto her hair and tried to suck it up. The vacuum suction was far from gentle and wretched the woman from her slumber. The woman's hair then became entangled in the cleaning device. The woman, who has not been named, was unable to free herself and called the fire department with a desperate rescue plea. The fire department is called after a robot vacuum cleaner attacks a sleeping owner's head. And Heinz Ketchup was forced to apologize after a QR code on a ketchup bottle linked to a hardcore porn site. So when you scan the label to read about the latest recipe promotion, you're instead directed to German porn site Funderado. And as we leave the living creatures of the smart city behind, we look up and drifting above us in this sea of neon haze, we see that drones, other connected smart creatures, have become as ubiquitous as pigeons. And the sky is thick with an infrastructure of everywhere. And the drones use the city data set to navigate. And the citizens of the city adorn their drones the way they once customized their phones. So in the city, drones, like all other talking, connected, smart gadgets, have become cultural creatures. And here above an audience drifts the glam rock drone rescued from the mosh pit of an outdoor music festival or the mirror drone mirror ball drone that catches itself in the spotlight or the harajuku drone which is adorned in 2000 throne charms rescued from the street markets of tokyo above us we see a menagerie of drones drifting through the city and as if dragging around their shouldered ghetto blasters in the 80s a few kids launch their own drone sound systems and the drones now carry speakers and they live broadcast the musical drones of their favorite old school drone music band it's a kind of surround sound system that has taken to the air and is thrown across the city as a kind of drone orchestra and the rumble of drone propellers becomes a new natural soundscape to the city of a new generation.
jogs in this city are walked by drones now, the city says. Think of the time saving, it screams. network of drones also monitor, monitor the wayward youth of a London council estate. And through their eyes we watch as a young girl has hacked and decorated her own drone and uses it to pass notes to her boyfriend trapped in the tower opposite. And like kids in an old-fashioned classroom, they scribble notes on the drone like old-school graffiti taggers and they send the drone back and forth between the tower. So in this near future city, drones form both agents of state surveillance, but also become co-opted as the aerial vehicles through which two teens might fall in love. And in another part of the city, a drone, armed just with a dildo, disrupts a Russian parliamentary session. And another zips overhead en route to attack a village in a country half a world away. Follow the Amazon Prime drone that's zipping about above us, the city says. We can follow it back to the Amazon warehouse. That's where we keep, well, everything, says the city. And now stretching out before us is the endless shelves and storage bins of the Amazon Fulfillment Center. Some of the Amazon bookshelves are stacked based on a complex sorting algorithm that's based on buying habits and sales frequencies and we watch as the Amazon robots rush through the stacks navigating from book to book filling their orders by the most efficient route generated for them by their navigational programming and this is the library of the smart city it's not organized around the Dewey decimal system but by buying habits and aggregated data sets and in a way this is a library that isn't organized for us space organized by digital logics and inhabited by bodies repurposed as machines. So in a way this is the physical world that we're left with when everything disappears into the lens of Google Glass or Oculus Rift. And in a way, modern film studios are an analogy for the rest of the city. A new kind of architecture, a new type of ornament that's based on calibration crosshairs and targets, stripped back to become the scaffolds and infrastructure for a digitally constructed world. An architecture that is lying in wait, ready for the premiere of a million animated movies that will illuminate its surface with color and detail. And the city is filled with the digital confetti of our desired worlds projected just for us. This is the future that the smart city promised us. spaces, the tailored ads, the navigational prompts, the floating Tinder profiles and track status updates of our sci-fi cityscapes, we will see a green screen world where everything has become a screen. And a YouTube cat video viral bursts from the screen. 
and in the eyes of Google Glass Holes that now skates across the living room floor. And the digital ephemera of the internet, the crap of YouTube now fills our physical spaces. And an empty room now fills with the flood of a newscast broadcasting the details of the latest tsunami that crashed up on the shores across the ocean. And what was once trapped on our screens now fills the world and we inhabit our own pixel dreams. Spaces are tattooed with the tracking markers required to locate all of our projected fantasies. We get back in our car, the driverless taxi rumbles on. We keep on moving through the point cloud and the city wants to take us to the Indian quarter of the smart city to meet a group of children playing hide and seek in the augmented reality alleyways. And they've learnt to hack the city's animated walls with a series of gesture controls. And just like their Xbox Connects play, they engage with the city with the exaggerated movements of a silent movie. And they've learnt some hack gestures that are somewhere between sign language and dance voguing. And they subvert the city through their play. They hack the city interface to open up its hidden service spaces subterranean forest power plant that's normally invisible behind the animated walls of the city. of the city who now 3D print their own clothes. So through the eyes of machines, their bodies are endlessly photographed, monitored, and laser scanned, all within millimeter precision. So for them, digital static distortions and glitches have become a strange new form of ornament. And they celebrate the corruption of their body data by molding within their costumery all the imperfections of a decaying scan file layer by layer, like a 3D printer drawing directly on the skin, they create these physical glitches, a manifestation 
combination of data in motion, imperfect, distorted, and always utterly unique. And in a way, what we're beginning to see is that these new forms of technology generate new forms of subculture, and people rally around the loopholes in the algorithm, and groups organize around and through technology. And behind the city, behind the smart icons and easy one clicks, these new subcultures are emerging from these new technologies. And the young ravers dance with explosive contortions as they invent a new choreography that distorts the silhouette and disguises the proportions of their frames so as to evade body detection algorithms that the city surveillance cameras use. And they do their ma makeup using the gloss black mirrors of their dead screens. And they reimagine their fashion cycles to follow the rate, of Ro the rate of Moore's law, the latest phone model or software update rather than a change in season. And they develop new camouflage textiles, a new hoodie that's designed to be invisible to the scanning technologies of the smart city. And the iridescent textiles reflect the light of CCTV laser scanners creating exuberant glitches and distortions in the data set and they hack the city searching for the wilds beyond the machine. So as we come to the end of our tour we see Hello World burning onto our screens. A Hello World program is a computer program that outputs Hello World onto some kind of display system. It's a super simple program that's used to verify that a language or system is operating correctly. It's the first word spoken to us by a new software system. And it announces itself. It tells us that everything is going to be just fine. Smart City, though, never gave us this warning. It never said hello. It's already here, and the Apple Store queue is starting to move. And we aren't sure how it got here, but we certainly aren't going to let it leave. It's just too seductive, too shiny, and too easy. And the services that were once public are now managed by the city. But after our tour, we're left asking the city just, who is this place for? Because the Smart City is not neutral. It's not universal, but fraught with the same contradictions as ourselves. And the future does not rush over us like water. It's something that we all play a part in shaping and defining. But we must start asking more questions of the gadgets that are defining our lives and cities because ideology rarely evolves at the same pace as our technology. And my watch tells me about a coffee machine it just met and the city wraps us in a warm embrace and the LEDs blink and the cooling fans spin and the streets are lined with sensors the electric magnetics hum and it smells like it's gonna rain and our faces are bright in the rolling glow of a rectangular screen aurora In the future, everything will be smart, connected and make it all better In the future Everything will be smart, connected, and make it all better. In the future, everything will be smart, connected, and make it all better. In the future, everything will be smart, connected, and make it all better. In the future, everything will be smart, connected, and make it all better. In the future, everything will be smart, connected, and make it all better. In the future, everything will be smart, connected, and make it all better. In the future, everything will be smart, connected, and make it all better. In the future, everything will be smart, connected, and make it all better. In the future.
Thanks. Questions or we drop the mic and walk out. Any questions, comments? Um, uh, yeah, totally off the mark, man. No. Um, uh, yeah, like, um, without fail, um, every time I do a talk, someone will ask the dystopia question. Um, and, uh, I mean, I, I always answer the same way. Like, for the most part, what we do is travel around the world and stick a camera in front of things and record it and then present it. So if it's dystopian, um, then that's the world we've created for ourselves. So it's not pessimistic, it's, um, it's uh, for once a dose of realism. Um, because what we try and do with the, with the work, with the stories we tell, is really trying to, um, to redress the balance. Because the dominant narrative presented to us in the media by, about these technologies is a solutionist one, right? Like, they're gonna make the world better, they got to be great, climate change, don't worry about it, we got it covered, um, uh, you're sick, it's all right, we have a cure, um, uh, oh, there's poor people, it's all right, um, uh, we've got mobile phones. Um, we just are trying to um, talk about the complexities of these systems, in a way, um, and talk about the fact that it's not that simple, um, and that technology has another side to it, it's a side that not, um, doesn't normally play well at tech conventions uh, or in the latest Apple store, but it's a side that nonetheless unless is there, so perhaps it's just um, fallen upon these stories um, to take all of our fears, but really it's just trying to make an argument for complexity, not for dystopia, or not for pessimism, but just um, uh, a form of nuance that the world finds it really difficult to comprehend at the moment. But there's obviously, I mean, you, you, you choose images, you, um, you choose um, parts of films, mm. there's a, a narration to it as well. So I was probably yeah. thinking more in terms of that. I mean, there's, a, there's also a mission behind it. Yeah, I mean, but, but things like. Um, I mean, uh, obviously the language is very carefully constructed. Um, we try and uh, talk in a romantic way about these systems and these technologies to describe the data center as um, uh, a place of the romantic poets, um, is to try and um, present a new, to present these landscapes in a cultural capacity um, because we don't normally think of them as such. But, um, uh, you know, we could present um, a series of images um, just like Elon Musk does, right? We could, we could present a hopeful utopian future where in 20 years the world's all going to be powered by solar cells and on the roofs of all these buildings is going to be little kind of milk cartons filled with baby tomatoes growing for us. Um, but that vision... Um, doesn't talk about um, the other conditions that are required in order to make that thing come true, right? Like, so we traveled to Lithium Bolivia, Kate and I with Unknown Fields, just after Elon Musk launched his new Powerwall battery and proclaim, proclaimed his vision for the future, which was gonna be this solar-powered green utopia. What he didn't talk about was where all the lithium to make the batteries to power this future comes from. And it comes from uh, Bolivia, as we were talking about in the, in the film. Um, uh, and that's not to say that this green future is any worse 
then the fossil fuel economy or the oil future we've already carved out for ourselves is just to say that it's more complicated and that we need to develop a way of talking about that side of technology as well as the hopeful TED Talk side, right? Um, we need to have a, a, a dialogue as a general public that includes that kind of subtlety, that, that talks about green energy in a way that is real, um, in a way that describes it not as clean or green at all, but is just better than all the other stuff we've got. Um, but that also acknowledges its consequences, you know? So for that um, green energy future of Musk to come true, he literally needs to buy the country of Bolivia, right? Um, and he, he may well do that, um, but there's a whole lot of consequences of that which should have been part of that keynote presentation. Um, he didn't do it for obvious reasons, um, uh, but... Um, he didn't do it because he knew how the world would react. Um, and I guess we try and tell these stories to talk about um, uh, opening up a different way of relating to those kind of stories, um, a way that um, uh, doesn't kill them, but um, uh, just um, is an attempt to make them more real. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah, we, yeah we, we, we've done that one. It, uh, it kind of eats its own tail in a way, right? Um, I mean, we went to Madagascar. Um, we snuck cameras into a, to a nickel mine um, that's this blood red dirt stain carved out of the precious, most precious rainforest on the planet. Um, and we sat there almost with a tear in our eye describing you know, how impossible it was that anyone could possibly do this to this landscape. Um, and as we we're talking, we always have a guide with us, like the, the company rep um, that's, uh, that's you know, telling us the propaganda campaign. Um, and then he started talking about all the things that the, that the, the metals that come out of that mine are used for, and one of them is um, Canon phone batteries, um, the very phone battery which is in our, in our camera as we try and take a photograph of this landscape. Um, so simultaneously, that landscape becomes an agent in both its own destruction and its redemption. Um, so the ironies of, of, of that isn't lost on us. I mean, we, we shot um, the toxic waste lake in Inner Mongolia with iPhones that produce that same lake. And that's part of the story, right? Is that we bring our technologies to that site um, we fix our hair in the mirrored screens that it, that very site polishes so we can stand on camera and um, present it to the world. Um, it's just one of the great ironies of um, uh, contemporary existence, really. Um, uh, but neither are we anti-technology, right? Like, it's not to say we should have gone there in straw hats and Hessian clothes um, and scribbled in charcoal on cave walls to describe that site. It's just to say that um, uh, you know, we're, we're all complicit in it, and we are as well, right? Like, um, uh, but so are you and everyone else in the room. Uh, so the onus is on us, right? Like the, what we try and avoid is, the, is the, the, the overly simplified narrative that these tech companies are the evil people, the mining companies are the ones fucking up the planet. Um, they're just doing what they're getting paid to do and they're doing it because we want them to. Um, so the people we're talking to is, is, is ourselves, right? Um, uh, not to the mining companies. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I guess and what, that's what we do at SIARC in, in fiction entertainment. We try and, like a Trojan horse, occupy these mediums of popular culture and entertainment with stories that somehow are meaningful and that's not always like save the planet, wherefore we're all fucked, um, technology's evil. Um, sometimes it's, you know, stories about people and about culture and about the future of cities and what driverless cars are going to do um, or their love stories. But um, they may be set in a context which is loaded with an architectural agenda. Um, uh, so like we try and parasitically occupy 
the the industries of entertainment um, to to load it with ideas that we think are, are useful, um, and that's part of the methodology of both these lectures, but also the films we do and and the and the program we want at SIARC is to um, is to um, try and communicate architectural ideas to people outside of rooms like this one, um, and you know they're not reading the journals that we get published in. They're not reading the same blogs that we read. They really don't give a shit what we do. Um, but they watch movies, um, and hopefully some of them read books. Uh, and um, that should be a new kind of site that us as architects and designers try and occupy, right? Thanks. Oh. Such a, such an Australian always late to the party, man. Ruining it for everybody.